chapter 10. Give you just a moment to find that. Hebrews chapter 10. As a way of a little bit of a heads up, you know that we have been in the study in the book of James. But the Lord led me to this passage of Scripture, and it works out for us because next month when I preach for you, it'll be about Thanksgiving. Next month when I preach for you, it'll be Christmas time. And we were about to launch into James chapter 4, and it's kind of a, a whole other subject, so we're holding off on that until January. And this morning, we are in this segment of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse number 19, and we're looking at assembly required. How many of you know that some things in life take some assembling, don't they? Okay, none of you have ever put together toys for your grandchildren at Christmas then. Uh, some of you realize and you know by saying that that assembly is required to make certain things and to have certain things. That's where we find ourselves this morning in Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse number 19. If you're there and ready for me to read, say go ahead. Go ahead. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us, say the words let us let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Say it with me let us hold fast the confession of of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Here it is again. And what? Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more, so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm one of those kind of people that uh, when I go to cook, I need a recipe. I, I'm not one of those ones that is all chaotic like all the people that cook, some that I know. Uh, I have to have a recipe. If I want to make a cake and it calls for eight ounces of milk, if I have only seven ounces of milk, I can't make a cake. I mean, I'm just not going to do it. I, I, it called for eight ounces. I don't have eight ounces. The cake can't be made, you know. Unlike my mother... My mother is the kind of cook that, you know, she made some recipe, made a delicious meal, and I asked her to give me the recipe for it. And she said, well, I put a little of this in it, and I put a little of that in it. I'm like, hold on, I'm trying to write it all down. I'm like, well, how much is a little of this? She said, well, I don't know, a little of this, you know? I'm like, okay, you know there's no international measurement for a little of this, you know? And so then she was, she was, I don't know, and she was guessing at measurements and saying, but that may not be it and all of this. And so uh, I thought, surely nobody else is like that. Nobody else would ever think about assembling a cake like my mother, where it's just, a, you know, just chaotic. A little of this, a little of that, just throw it all in. I mean, who in the world would ever do that? I thought, surely 8 billion people on the planet, she's the only one. that I got stressed just thinking about it. She was the only one that ever cooked like that and then I met my wife. <laughs> my wife considers everything in a recipe a suggestion. <laughs> If it calls for eight ounces of milk, we could have three and a half ounces of milk, and it doesn't matter. It's a suggestion. And just kind of throw it all together to try to make it work. Well, how many of you know that sometimes if you don't assemble things right, they don't turn out right? And some things will never be what they're supposed to be unless they are assembled, just like putting ingredients into a cake. Same thing is true when it comes to our Christian life. You and I can be a Christian by virtue of the fact that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins. And because we have confessed our sins and asked for the forgiveness of those sins, we have been made a child of God. But to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, assembly is required. 
required. Assembly is required. There are things that must be a part of our life. You just don't get saved and then all the rest of your life live for yourself and do what you want to. Now you live for Christ. You live according to His rule book. You live according to the things that He's called us to. And that is what's being discussed here when we get to this one small segment of the book of Hebrews here. That These, these five verses that we're looking at together here, six verses rather, have everything to do with the importance of assembling together. You know, I, it was always a difficult sermon every time when I was growing up as a kid when our pastor would strike this text because immediately you knew what was about to follow. He was about to, he was about to whip the sheep that are in attendance for not attending church. I never understood it. it. never made sense to me. I'm like, I'm here. Why are you angry with me? You know, I don't fully understand that. But when we get to this whole subject, and so we're going to deal with the end of the message at the beginning because it's going to help you get more out of it because you won't be wondering for the next 26 and a half minutes when I'm going to get to the why don't you attend church more segment, okay? So let's have it right up front. There are two groups of people. They're polarized for the most part. They're on extremes of their view of church attendance. You have those that are on the far, on one side that believe in perfect attendance. I mean, they and let me tell you, they're like a vegetarian. How do you know somebody's a vegetarian? Because they tell you all the time. You know, <laughs> you know, people that are a perfect attender because they do what they tell you all the time. They want you to know they have never missed. They will even brag about the one time in 1907 when there was a big snowstorm and even the pastor didn't show up to unlock the door. And they just sat out there, waited till 12 o'clock in the heated car and then drove back home so they could count it as attendance on their record. They're the perfect attenders, and they do it for the issue of pride. They love to tell you how they rearrange all of their vacation. They never accept a job that makes them work on Sundays, and they're always in the house of God. However, comma, they've not done anything for Jesus in over 20 years. They can't even tell you the last time they shared their faith with an unbeliever. The altars haven't been visited by them in years. But their reason for attending church is, I want to know that I was here, present, and accounted for so that I've got perfect attendance. And I'm here to tell you, attendance is only part of the reason for assembling together. It's not about you being here as much as it is what you do while you are here in God's house. And if we are doing what we're supposed to be doing when we come into God's house, you're going to want to be in God's house, and both issues are taken care of. Now, you got people on the other side. Let's go visit this other group of people. And you have these other people that they don't come as often as they should, and for certain as often as a pastor wish they would be in church. They're the ones that feel guilty when this passage of Scripture is struck and the pastor is about to talk about it. They know they should attend church a little bit more. And some of them link upon this and they say well you know I, I'm in a good place right now and I just really don't need church right now and that view church is something you go to that you need in other words I have a cough so I need cough syrup I don't think about cough syrup until I get a cough but then I need it so it can take care of my cough and if you church that way when life gets difficult then I need to be in the house of God when life gets difficult then I need to go to church and they also have a wrong view of church because they view it is something that you just do when everything's going wrong in your life or when you personally need something in life. And the truth is assembling together has less to do with you and everything to do about Jesus Christ and everyone sitting around you. It's not about you. Church has never been intended to be about you. It's about us. It's about you and me together as a body of believers congregating together for one purpose to focus on Jesus Christ and to be made more like Him. That's why we do these things. And that's what the writer of Hebrews here was doing. So, who wrote the book of Hebrews? We don't really know. Theologians are still debating that today. All of them are just doing guesswork on it. However, I figured it out a long time ago. The Holy Spirit wrote the book of Hebrews. I'm not for sure whose hand held the quill and dipped it in the ink and wrote it, but I can tell you this. We know that it was God-breathed and given to you and I, so we can kind of move past that one and go to our next question, and that is this. Who was the book written to? The book was written to the 
Hebrews, obviously, the letter to the Hebrews. But these were Hebrews that had followed Judaism, but now they've come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because of being persecuted for that, some of whom were being excommunicated from their family, some of them tempted to go back to the sacrificial system instead of staying with their relationship with Jesus Christ. Sounds a little bit like the people in the book of Exodus. You know, they were in slavery and, and they got called out and they went into this new land and now they were griping and complaining about where God had them and they were looking at going back into slavery where the food was better. Okay? This is kind of what was going on and the writer was encouraging them to stay on track, to not turn back, to keep moving forward. Therefore, that's how we see the theme that runs all the way through the book. And the theme is this, that Jesus Christ is better than anything and anyone. Jesus Christ is better than the sacrifices. Jesus Christ is better than the angels. He's better than the patriarchs. He is better. He is the new and living way. He is the Son of God. And so this letter was written to encourage them not to go back, to encourage them to keep moving forward in Jesus Christ. And specifically here addressing with the issue of assembling together. And so you and I are going to look at this this morning and together I want you to see what the writer showed us and that is this. Two reasons why you and I assemble together in the house of God. Two reasons. Number one is this. We assemble because of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. <laughs> we assemble because of Jesus Christ. Let's look at it again. Let's read from verse number 19. Therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Notice here the author is writing to the brethren. This is to a group. This isn't like the letter to Philemon or the letter to Timothy. It isn't to an individual with a whole group in mind. This is written to the group of Hebrews. It's saying brethren listen to me. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now I, one of the things I love right there is he's already stating the fact. You and I, by virtue of being the children of God, we already have the boldness to come into the presence of God. It doesn't have to be acquired. It's not anything you got to go looking for. You don't even have to go shopping for it on Amazon. It's yours. If you are a child of God, you have been given the privilege of direct access to God. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. How are we able to have it? Because of His sacrifice that He made to you and I. And we're allowed to be in the holiest into the presence of God. And this was given to you and I, look at it, by a new and living way. By a new and living way. I, I, this was important to the Hebrews that were being written to because all of this was new territory for them. They were used to the old sacrificial system. They were used to the fact that once a year the veil would be open and a priest could go in on behalf of God's people once a year. There was limited access to God. Now Jesus Christ comes along and he becomes the new and living way. He is the one that has now made the way for us to come into the presence of God. It kind of for me echoes the words of Jesus himself in John 14 6. Remember what he said to the disciples? He said to them, I am the what? Way. The way. The truth and the life. The rest of it, no one comes to the Father except through me. So because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, because because His blood was shed for you and I, because He is the new and living way, we have full access into the presence of God. Uh, we have full access to come before Him as His children, to have that intimate relationship with Him, that, fam that family level relationship with God. It goes further to say this in even more detail for you and I, new and living way which Jesus consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Here in the, is, uh, is talking about the in the Old Testament, they would have between the holy and the holy of holies, they would have this large veil, and that veil would be the only place into that would be for that priest once a year to go in. But we're being told here now that God didn't just roll up that veil and lay it aside. He didn't just pull the curtain open just a little bit. The Bible says that that curtain was torn because of the death of of Jesus Christ, the veil has been swung wide open, it has been left open, 
heaven for anyone who wants to come to God. We now have full access into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, into who He is and what He offers. Why? Because of Jesus Christ and because we are the children of God. And so because of that, we have full access to God. I, uh, I utilize on my day off of one of my favorite functions on my cell phone called Favorites. Favorites is a list you can make of all the contacts that are in your phone. So if you turn on your do not disturb function on the phone, the only people that can reach you are those that are on the Favorites list. My favorites list, just if you're wondering who's on there, is my family. My family's on my favorites list. So that means when I put my phone on do not disturb, anyone who calls me automatically goes to voicemail. Anyone who texts me, it goes into a folder, and I don't even have to see it unless I want to go see it. And if you try FaceTime, you'll get a busy signal. You don't have that level of access to me at that moment. But those that are on my favorites list, my family, they have that access. If they call me during do not function, guess what? The phone rings. If they face FaceTime me, the video comes up. If they text me, it pops up right on my front screen. Why? They are my family. They have an access to me that nobody else has. And I'm here to tell you, by being a child of God, you have been put on God's favorites list. You have been put on a list where any time you call on God, day or night, He's there to hear you, to listen to you, and to answer you. He's there with the door wide open, with an open door policy saying, I want you to come into my presence and I want you to be with me. You and I think about it are on God's favorites list. We have full access anytime and I think unfortunately because we know that to be true and because we are Americans where we live in a nation where we are not fearful this morning of being arrested by preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. We're not going to be in prison for worshiping Him and praying to Him this morning. Because of all those things sometimes we take that access to God for granted instead of taking it for the pleasure that it was really meant to be. Remember what the psalmist said in Psalms chapter 16 verse number 11? He described the presence of God this way, in your presence is what? Fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's the presence of God that we're talking about this morning and we have access to that and that is one of the reasons that you and I assemble together in God's house is because because of Jesus Christ, what He did on the cross for you and I to make it available for us to have direct access to God anytime as we come together before Him. That's reason number one. Let's look at the second reason. This gets more practical. The first one is what has been done for us through Jesus Christ. The second one gets real practical. This gets into the nuts and bolts of the assembly, if you will. This gets into the ingredients of the recipe here. We assemble symbol because of us. Say, I am an us. I know it doesn't sound right, but say it again anyways. <laughs> I am an us. When we talk about let us, the writer here of Hebrews is saying, let all of us, let us all come together. Let us do this. Let us do that. And he lays out for you and I here three reasons under this assembly here, three reasons that we assemble together. And we're going to look at them. I had you when we read the passage in the very beginning to say these with me, each one of the let us out loud. So let's now go back through these and look at these. So we assemble together because of us. Number one, let us draw near. Look in verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This let us draw near from the original Greek here means keep on coming near to God. Keep on coming. This isn't a one-time thing. This isn't a, hey, I remember in 1989 that I went near God. No, this is a every, every day. God's doing this. I want to move in that direction. Charles Wesley said many years ago about following God. He says, I want to know what God is doing in my generation and I will give everything I've got to it. 
That's what it means to draw close to God. If God's doing it, I want to be doing it. If God's moving in this way, I want to be a part of it. If God needs this done through the church, I want to be the one that's doing it. It's a matter of drawing near to that person and, and being near to that person of God that, that he should be to each and every one of us. Why? Because we have that access. Why? Because we're his children. Wouldn't you, don't you think you would want to be in the presence of your heavenly father in heaven above? You know, uh, we love it with our earthly children when they want to see us and they want to be with us. We, we love it when they come for visits. I, uh, growing up, both of my parents are the oldest of all their siblings and both of them have several siblings. I grew up with dozens and dozens of cousins and, uh, and every year at Christmas Eve we went to my Granny Wright's house and on Christmas Day we went to Grandma Burton's house and, uh, and then in between those was our time, early Christmas morning, you know, at 4 a.m. whenever we'd wake up our parents, you know, want our gifts, you know. Uh, but we go to Granny's house and, and I don't know if it's because she lives so close to our house or because my dad's the oldest or because he's kind of just always looked out after them but we were, we were always the first one at Granny's house. And Granny was always excited to see us. I mean everything smelled good, things, pies were baking, food was cooking. I mean it was just, you know, it was wonderful. And we show up and Granny's excited to see us all and she hugs us and everything. But guess what? Then all of a sudden I'd see my cousins come in with my aunts and uncles and she'd get a little happier. And then the other aunt and uncle come in with all their kids and Granny got a little bit happier. And I remember as a small boy, there was something about knowing that when I showed up at her house, it always put a big smile on her face. I mean, it just always made her grin. I mean, looking back as an adult now, I realize some days are difficult. Some days can be really bad. And to think that maybe on some of those days when Granny was having a really bad day, that when I entered into her presence, how it just made her joyful. If that can be said about an earthly, frail human relationship, how much more should that be said of our Heavenly Father above? I really want you to grab this picture that when we draw near to God, it causes God's heart to soar. He realizes that communion that we're going to have with one another. He knows what it will do for us. He knows how it will change us. He knows how it will make us more like His Son. And it begins to fill Him even with this presence of wow, they're here. Wow, we're here together. And the same thing should be true of us. We should want to come into the presence of God. We should want to assemble together and come before Him. And one of the best ways to do that is to come together in the house of God, worshiping God together, praying to God together, hearing from God together, responding to God's Word together by drawing near to God. God wants to be with you. Don't we want to be with Him? Yeah. Don't we want to be in His presence? Yeah. Don't we want to be right there? The, the writer here is saying, come on, folks. It's almost like a, a, one of those spirit rallies you had in high school before the football game, you know, trying to get you all charged up. That's what Hebrews writer is doing here. He's saying this. He's saying, let us, come on, folks, let us do this. Let us draw near to God. And everyone will respond, I want to draw near to God. And we come into His presence. That is what this is about. Now this verse here, let us draw near, is talking about how can we draw near to God because we can have a true heart. We can come in fullness of full assurance of faith. Why? Because our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know why we can come in confidence before God? Because the blood of Jesus Christ has covered our sins. Because I don't come in my own righteousness. I come under the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I don't come into that room because of any love level of arrogance like I deserve to be here or, or God better be glad that I'm here. Instead I come marching in to the beat of I get to be here. I am here because of Jesus. I am here because of what he's done and I'm here because God loves me with an everlasting love. That should, wanna, should cause us to want to draw near to God. This is one of those ingredients, part of that assembling together that can better be done when we are together. Let us draw near. Let us draw near here has to do with our relationship with God. Has to do with our relationship with God. People that we love in our life, one of the things that I've noticed in human nature is this. When you're in love with somebody, whether that's a spouse, whether that's a parent, a child, a best friend, whatever it is, when you have that love relationship with someone else as a friendship or otherwise, the things that they enjoy, you enjoy also. 
may not be anything else that you would have enjoyed at any other time, but because of the pure enjoyment they get out of it, then you get enjoyment out of it also. In our household, it could never be said that my wife is a hardcore Chiefs fan. I know it's sad, I understand, but, I, but it cannot be said of her. She reminded me again this morning when I got up this morning at 5 o'clock and donned my Kansas City Chiefs number 15 shirt this morning to come out to the church to pray because I thought I'd pray a little better with 15 on my T-shirt. <laughs> And after saying good morning to her, I said, the Chiefs play today, 325. And my wife's response was, you're going to watch it downstairs, right? <laughs> she won't look at me because she knows that's true. <laughs> You're going to watch it downstairs, right? Why? Because she admits it. She says, because, you know, you get loud, you know? I mean, I did. you know, she said, and, and, and when the dang game gets tight, you just stand the whole time and pace the floor, you know? I mean, I'm just, so in our household, I get the award for being the hardcore cheese fan, not my wife. But, she, but even though that, even though because I love to watch football, she has taken a level of interest in football that she would have never done before. Why? Because she loves me. Why? Because we're in a relationship. How much more so it should be true about you and I because of what God has done through us, through His Son, Jesus Christ. It should all of a sudden make us love Him more. Make us want to be with Him more. Make us want to be in the midst of all that He is doing and all that He wants to do in this generation. So this first one has to do with our relationship with God. Number The second one is this. The first one is let us draw near. The second one is let us hold fast. Look in verse number 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Say the word hope. hope. Say it again. Hope. hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. This, this phrase here, let us hold fast, carries the meaning, on, meaning of to keep on possessing the confession of our hope and to persevere and maintain an unwavering hope. That's what we're called to here, to let us hold fast. I, I read in a sermon this last week from Charles Spurgeon, one of the preachers of generations past that I enjoy, and I read and he made a statement in one of his sermons about this text right here and he said that every Christian should write on the cover of their Bible, hold fast. Hold fast. Because in this world, you're going to be pulled to the right and to the left. In this world, you're going to be pulled down, not often pulled up, but occasionally. You'll be pulled down. There'll be a tug of war between your spirit and your flesh. There's going to be times that hope almost seems elusive. There's going to be times in your life where it seems like everything's going wrong. And there will be, just like the Hebrews being written to here, a temptation to not hope. A temptation to let our our hope waver. And God wants to remind us, don't let it be so. Don't let it be so. So as a part of this pep rally, the Hebrew writer is saying this, let us hold fast. Hold fast to what? To the confession of faith that we have of the hope without wavering. That we say, no matter what, we're going to hold on to this. No matter what, I'm going to anchor myself to this. This will be my confession. The unwavering hope in my life. So, so because of that, let's talk about hope for just a minute. You see, you and I as Christians, we have what the Bible calls the hope of glory. We have the hope of glory. Write this verse down and I'll read it to you. Colossians 1.27. Paul writing to the church at Colossae says this, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of His mystery among the Gentiles. Here's that mystery, that glorious, that wonderful thought, that truth. And that is this, Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If there's anyone in this world that should have a hope, it should be the child of God. If there's anyone in this world that can face what seems to be unsurmountable obstacles and things that are devastating and still be anchored to hope, it should be the children of God. Why? Because hope lives inside of me. Why? Because hope died on a cross for me. Why? Because hope is one of the names of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And who he saved, he will keep if we hold fast to him. 
But we have a responsibility when we are tempted to waver to say, oh no, I'm going to hold fast. Oh no, I'm going to hold fast. Let's talk a little bit more about this hope. Not only do we have the hope of glory, but we have it as a description of the blessed hope. Listen to Titus. Write this down and I'll read it to you also. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Paul writing to Titus, a young pastor he left in, the, the, in Crete to set things in order that were lacking to pastor, to set leaders in place and all this. And in many ways it's viewed as a, a three chapters on church government and on leaders and everything. But right smack dab in the middle of this book, he talks about the return of Jesus Christ. And he describes it this way in Titus chapter 2 verse 13. That you and I are looking, quoting, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you know what those combined together tell me is they tell me it tells me this, that I have the hope of glory living in me. And if that's not enough to keep me from wavering, if that's not enough to keep me holding on fast to the hope that I confess, I've got one more reason to hold on to my hope. And that is this. There is coming a day. There is coming a moment. I don't know when it will be. The Bible just says it'll be when you think not. The Bible just says that it will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. But there is coming some moment in time where all of a sudden God is going to say enough is enough and I want you to bring my children home. And all of a sudden from heaven there will be the shout. There will be the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds forever. And that is the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Uh, and that is a reason to hold on fast. That is a reason to let us hold fast. I grew up on a farm in Arkansas, and, uh, and uh, I, I have so many fond memories of it, but no desire whatsoever to go do it. <laughs> but I have fond memories. Some of the funnest moments that I ever had with my dad on the farm is when my dad would look at me and say, son, hold on. It was about the time my dad said, son, hold on, because I have to put all this in perspective. My mom and dad had us when we were so young. I th although I thought they were ancient, I mean, in some of these stories I'm going to tell you, my dad was only like 27 years old, you know, 28. I mean, he was just a kid, you know, really, kid raising kids. But my dad had this thing where he, he, lo he loved his four-wheel drive truck, and sometimes he just wanted to see what he could do with it in the mud, you know. Sometimes he just wanted to see if he really could cross that creek with his truck, you know, or that truck. And so he'd always look at me, he'd go, son, hold on. Every time my dad said, son, hold on, something fun was about to happen. I don't know what, but he was letting me know to hold on because if I don't hold on, I may end up with a busted lip or hit my head on the window or something, you know. And we'd hold on and here'd go dad four wheeling in the mud. Or, you know, again, he was a kid raising kids. I mean, he was just having fun and we would do those things. Some of the greatest moments that I remember as a kid was right after my dad would say, son, hold on, son, hold on. And God is saying to us, child, hold on. Child, hold on to your hope. Hold on to it. Great things are going to happen. Hold on to it. It may look bleak now, but it's about to look a whole lot brighter. Hold on, because there may be sorrow at the nighttime. There may be crying through the night, but I'm here to tell you, night only lasts for a little while, and then the day is going to dawn, and when it dawns, it will be a whole new day, and it'll be your day, and it'll be your time, and it'll be your blessings from me upon your life. That is what God is saying to you and I when He's telling us, let us us hold on to this confession of our hope. What? Without wavering. Here's why. For he who promised is faithful. That means that I can anchor my hope to every single thing and every single promise God made in this word because he will keep every promise he ever made. Your experience of whether you believe it or not does not change the faithfulness of the promise of God. Because this is true whether you believe it or not. This is true whether you live according to it or not.
This is true whether anybody listens to you when you share it or not. This is the truth of God. And we are called to hold fast. Hold fast to this hope without wavering. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. He who promised will keep his word. The first one dealt with our relationship with God. This one here on Let Us Hold Fast deals with our relationship with the world that's around us. The world around us needs to see you holding on to hope in the midst of what would be hopeless to anyone else. The world needs to be able to see that. It needs to be that testimony. Unless you doubt that, there are many places in the passage of Scripture where it talks about letting our good works be seen among men. They need to see us. The gospel message of personal evangelism and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, it is supposed to be heard and seen. We just don't tell people about the hope that they can have in Jesus Christ. We demonstrate it by the love that we have, All of, by, the, by the hope that we have. All of this is, is reminiscent of what we read about in Romans chapter 5 where the Bible says, but God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. God said that He loved the whole world and guess what? That is the truth and He did not need to prove it. But because He proved it, I'm able to hold on to it and I'm able to move forward. So He demonstrated it through the death of His Son on a cross for you and I. So let us draw near applies to our relationship with God. Let us hold fast is not only good for our soul, but it is a great testimony to those who are around us. The third one in this segment of assembling is for us, and that is this. Let us stir up. Say stir up. Stir up. Say it again. Stir. Let us stir up. Let's look at it together. Verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good work not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together as is the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much more the more as you see the day approaching. Why are we to consider one another? It says it right up front. We're to consider one another to stir up other people. Now, some people have the gift of stirring up but just not for the right reasons. <laughs> Can we just get the elephant in the room out of the way, Okay. There are some people that are good at stirring up trouble, stirring up drama. I have acquaintances in my life, they don't even know it, but they thrive on chaos and drama. And if there is none, they find a way to what? Stir it up, mix it up. I, hold on, life got peaceful for a minute. We can't have all of that, you know. Here it comes. Got to stir up a little drama. Got to find something to complain about, somebody to talk about, somebody that was talking about me, and I'm going to tell you what they said about me and how much I didn't like it. They just, they cannot seem to live without it. That's not what we're talking about right here. <laughs> if you're going to stir up, why not use that same gift to stir up for the good? Now this word stir up here, I am going to admit right up front, in the Greek it can be used negatively or, or positively. Negatively, an example of that would be the same Greek structure of this word is used when it talked about the, the confrontation between Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts when they parted ways. That's one of the ways it was talked about negative. Here, it's used in the positive. It's used in the good sense of stirring you up. I, I hope you have these kind of people I'm about to describe in your life, but there are some people that when I'm around them, and after I leave from being around them, I'm better off than I was before I showed up. I walk away and I think, wow, if I bless their life even half as much as they bless my life, then they must really be getting a blessing from the Lord. I have people like that that are in my life. I have people like that in this church that are in my life. And you know how come I know that? Because I come to church and you come to church and we're considering one another to stir one another up to love and good deeds. So here it's used in a positive sense. What is this stirring? It is stirring specifically to love and good deeds. To love and good deeds. It, it's intended to make you better off. I like how the King James, I believe it's the King James that says, spur one another on to love and good deeds. What a, what a beautiful picture that is, that we come together. One of the reasons we're called to assemble together is for the sake of stirring each other up. 
And I cannot consider you and know what's going on in your life if I never see you. If I don't have a donut with you in the fellowship hall. If I don't have a conversation with you out in the foyer. If I didn't have the chance to pray with you around the altar when you pour your heart out in a prayer request of something that's caused you great pain and great sorrow. I, that's the way that we're able to do it because we can only consider one another if you're around one another. And if there is never any other reason but this one reason for us to be in church regular, often, and with purpose, and that is this. How else will you ever obey the commandments called the one another's? How can I ever love one another if I never see you? How can, I, how can I be a part of encouraging one another if I'm never in your presence? How can I exhort you if I'm, if I'm not near you and we're experiencing something together? How can that be possible? You see, we come together for this purpose of us, for this purpose of being a what the, what's referred to as the body of believers, this church. Why? To stir each other up to love and good works. And this is best done within the context of what the verse here calls the assembling of ourselves together. This third let us, this let us stir up has to do with our relationship with one another. The first one was with God. The second one was with the world around us. This one very specifically to you and I. Very specifically to you and I. We are called to stir up one another to love and good works. We're going to round out this message by looking at verse 25. Not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together. Thank you for not doing that today. I realize you could have. It is the weather outside is bodacious, folks. I'm just telling you. It was this beautiful when I was up this morning driving into church real early. It was that beautiful when I was leaving here to go home and put on something besides shorts to preach in. It's beautiful outside. And you chose to use the beauty of this morning to be in the house of God. Wow. Clap for yourself. <laughs> But what about next week? What about tonight? What about Wednesday night? What about ladies' Bible study on Thursday? What about? You see, it's a matter of not just the once and done. It's not a matter of the occasional. It's a matter of the I'm not going to forsake the assembling of myself together, as is the manner of some, Instead, I will receive the exhorting from one another. And here it is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. By being a pastor, I have this push and pull that goes on in my soul. In many ways, being a pastor is much like being a father of children. Bible refers to as a shepherd over a sheep, that kind of a relationship. So many times I can see as a spiritual leader what I know really is and can be the best for you. And then when you're not doing it, 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 it pains me. I'm like, don't they understand that if they were doing this, why? Oh, come on, God, help them in this moment. Help them in this moment. One of the things about this text is this. I know personally the benefit of being in God's house. Not just because the Bible says so, but because it is so. That's where great things happen. That's where even greater things can happen. And we have a culture. When I say a culture, I'm not talking about our individual church. I'm talking about the American church globally in America that the closer we're getting to the return of Christ there is a clarion call from church leaders for less church instead of more the writer of Hebrews said and much more as we see the day approaching and what happens the longer we've served the Lord the less and less 
people cross the threshold of the door into the sanctuary. Because there's this sense of, I don't need it. There's this sense I've already done it. Though that may be an emotional feeling for you and a personal feeling for you, it's not a biblical truth. Truth is, we are to assemble together. To be together. Why? To stir one another on to love and good deeds. I want to give you just a few examples. The benefits of being in the house of God. Me being in the house of God, don't mean to embarrass you, Ray, but I'm going to. Me being in the house of God is the only reason I even met Ray Hill in the first place. Over this time that I've gotten to know him, there have been so many times, probably even unbeknownst to him even, he didn't realize he was even doing it, that he thoroughly has encouraged me in the ministry. Thoroughly. One of which is that by being close to me and us getting to talk and everything, he knew that a lot was going on around the church. He was like, what can I do to help out? Don't ask me that. I've always got a list. <laughs> Ray knows that firsthand. I said, well, you know, we've got a lot of light bulbs that need to be changed in the church. He's like, oh, sure, Pastor, I got you. No problem, man. I'll take care of it. I said, okay, I'll get somebody to help you. No, I don't need anybody to help me. I, I got it. I got it. I have nobody to help me. I said, I'll get somebody to help you. Got Cole to come out and help him. About halfway through it, he comes in to get another cold bottle of water, drenched from sweat, top to bottom. He says, man, I'm really glad you asked Cole to come help me with all this, you know. <laughs> Now, we're having a little bit of fun with that. That one thing drew the two of us closer together, doing something for the house of God. And coming to church, even this morning, he said something very encouraging to me right before the service this morning. And that's one of many accounts. I could go into every section here and list the benefits that I get by being in the house of God because of you. See, attending church has never been about you. It's about us. Yeah. It's about us. And even much more as we see the day approaching. So the questions are this. Are you saved this morning? If you're saved and you know us, say amen. amen. I want to talk to those that are in our online crowd. You've been listening to this message and man, something inside is telling you that that preacher, you, you've stuck with us this long because something inside is telling you this is all true. Something inside is telling you you need this. And it's this simple. God, forgive me of my sins. God, take my life and use it. Do something with it. In that moment, God removes sin from your life, gives you a relationship with Him. But then He gives you all the added benefits of being with you as you live every day your life on this earth. And He makes you into something wonderful. He makes you like His Son, Jesus Christ. If you want that relationship, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. Wherever you're at, you may be in your pickup, watching this on your phone screen, looking for some kind of hope in life. You've been just doom scrolling and you happen to find us. I want you right now where you're at on the other side of the screen to pray this prayer with me. This congregation is going to say it with you. And this is what it will take, this simple, to become a child of God. Pray with me right there on the other side of the screen. Congregation, join us with our online crowd in this prayer this morning. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he died for me. Forgive me of all my sins. Help me to know you. My life is yours every day I live. Thank you again for Jesus Christ. Amen. That's simple. You have now become a child of God, forgiven of your sins. And if you've made that decision, we want to rejoice with you. Will you look at the bottom of this video, get that phone number, give us a call. Let us know what God's done in your life. We want to see you continue in your relationship with God. The second question is for you. Are you faithful? Not just church attendance. That's, that's, that's only one. I'm talking all this stuff. Are you holding fast? Are you holding on? Are you drawing near to God? Are you looking when you come to church, who can I minister to? Or are you really only here for you? What can I do? What, who is it here today that I could smile at and take them to a new level in their life? Are you faithful to the things of God? Only you can answer that question. And truthfully, only you can do something about it. So let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We're ever so grateful for you and your son, Jesus Christ, and all that you have done for us. Father, not the least of which is your son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for our sins. Dying on the cross for our sins and even showing us that we are your church because of that. 
And if your son was willing to die for your people to make us your church, God, then we're willing to come and to serve you and to hold fast and to draw near and to stir up and to be what you've called us to be. Help us, God, Father, to order our lives according to you and help us, Father, to be able to serve you all the days of our life in faithfulness. So on one day, when we all stand before you, the sheep from the goats, you'll look at us, your children as sheep, and we'll be able to hear your words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And for those things, we thank you in advance, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand, join Chris. Let's sing this